Well, I think we are indeed both privileged and fortunate um, to have as our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Emmanuel Navon, and a warm welcome, um, Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, Dr. Navon, as many of you will know, is an international relations expert, and he has a master's degree and a doctorate in international relations from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He began his career specialising in research and development funding and then in training business leaders in public diplomacy. He's also a lecturer at the Reichman University, Israel's military academy and Tel Aviv's University School of Political Science and International Relations. He's a senior fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum and the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. He's a senior foreign affairs analyst for I-24 News, and his views have been cited across Israel, uh, French and English media platforms. He regularly comments on Israeli politics for the Times of Israel. Professor Navon has published several books. His latest book, The Star and the Scepter, A Diplomatic History of Israel, which discusses Israel's foreign policy, the diplomatic history of the Jewish people, and the transitions into Israel's modernity is soon to be published in French with the support of Elnet. Last week, Professor Navon, when interviewed on I24 News, gave an analysis of the situation in the Ukraine, which he has added to today, and I believe there's a link in the chat for uh, everybody who wants to avail themselves of that. Um, and how best to respond to Putin's demands, and we will hear more of that a little later, but now, um, let me say again, warm welcome, and perhaps we can start with the Amnesty International um, report um, and then move on to some of the major foreign affairs issues that are of uh, great and immediate concern. So as, um, as David said, this report, um, malicious report, riddled with legal inaccuracies and false claims about Israel, and um, in particular, this term, an apartheid state. Can I ask you, um, uh, Professor Navon, what should the next steps be if we are to effectively counter the impact of the report, notably Amnesty's false accusation of apartheid, both here in the UK and also internationally? I pick out the UK because, of course, it's Amnesty International UK that has initiated this, this terrible report floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed, both for the uh, invitation and uh, for the introduction. So what you've said about the uh, amnesty report <clears throat> is correct, but uh, I think there is a deeper reason uh, for the gravity and uh, the lethal effect uh, of uh, this uh, report. You see, uh, amnesty has uh, replicated the methods and the messages uh, of Soviet propaganda against uh, Israel uh, the same propaganda that produced the uh, 1975 UN resolution, uh, which had defined Zionism as a form of racism. Now, since the right to national self-determination is universal, it cannot be denied to anyone, including uh, the Jews. How do you deny the Jews, and the Jews only, this uh, universal right? The one easy way out is to claim that the Jews are not a nation, but only a religion, and presto, they don't deserve a state. Uh, this is what the uh, PLO did in its uh, charter. Now, the problem with this uh, argument is that A, it is false, and B, if you start questioning the authenticity of one specific national identity, you open a Pandora box uh, from which no nation is immune. Uh, especially uh, the so-called uh, Palestinian people, which had been unheard of until the late 1960s. So you need to be smarter, which is what the Soviets explained to Arafat, uh, by convincing the world that Jewish nationalism and only uh, Jewish nationalism is intrinsically racist. Now, if Jewish nationalism is intrinsically racist, then it is legitimate to deny the Jews and the Jews only the right to national self-determination. And this is exactly what the <clears throat> 1975 UN resolution was about. Now, this resolution was uh, thankfully repealed in 1991, 
uh, but Amnesty is using the same exact trick in its report. Uh, the report singles out Jewish nationalism and only Jewish nationalism as racist and discriminatory. Uh, what Amnesty is saying is that the Jews are really out of luck because their national movement happens to be the only uh, national movement in the world that suffers from a genetic uh, disease. Uh, thankfully, Amnesty adds, uh, we have found the cure, uh, kill the patient, and this illness will uh, be gone. This is basically what the report recommends. It openly supports the uh, so-called uh, Palestinian right of return, whose implementation would end the existence of Israel as a nation state and turn the Jews into a minority into their former country. But Amnesty is not only uh, coldly recommending the dismantling of the state of Israel. This recommendation comes with good news, according to Am Amnesty, because doing so would be mere compliance with international law. How lucky. You shouldn't feel bad about getting rid of this specific country called Israel, because by doing so, you're actually fulfilling your obligation and to under international law. Now, this is the Amnesty report in a nutshell. As you've said, just calling out the lies isn't enough. Amnesty has declared war on Israel. This war must be fought and won by Israel. And that means doing two things. First, get all Western democracies to condemn the report, and not only Anglo-Saxon democracies. We need all EU members to be on board. And the fact, for example, that France has not yet added its voice to those of Germany and of the UK, for example, is a disgrace. This is where we need LNET to use all its five power. We must make sure that amnesty only gets the support of autocracies and human rights abusers. In other words, we must, we must make amnesty look like the Human Rights Council. The second part of the strategy is a coordinated campaign to delegitimize and defund amnesty. Delegitimizing amnesty means exposing it for what it is. A former, a former human rights organization that is driven today by a radical ideology mostly directed against the West. An amnesty must be hurt in the pocket. If they can run a campaign to dismantle Israel, surely we can run a campaign to cut down the donations. Any government donation must be targeted as a priority. As I said, amnesty has declared war on us. And uh, as the French say, À la guerre comme à la guerre. It really, I mean, what you've said there about um, um, delegitimizing Israel and demonizing Israel, and, um, you know, of all the, the only country in the world where they want to deny um, the state of Israel, it does remind me, and you talked about that, you know, the hard left, where Amnesty International. Um, have quite a big influence within the hard left. And of course, Jeremy Corbyn tried to move an amendment to the IRA definition when we were debating it in this in the UK, that it was not anti-Semitic to say uh, Zionism it was a racist endeavour. Well, of course it is. Do you think we do enough in terms of education? Because many of the young people who are affected by this kind of report um, it's hearts and minds, isn't it? These young people, that's why I think the word apartheid is so strong. They want to do something that is active. They want to take action, not, not just read about something. And this resonance with the sanctions against South Africa, they think we can do something real, um, like was affected in South Africa with a great hero like Nelson Mandela. They think they can do the same thing in to Israel for Palestinians, not that it helps them at all. And the problem with this is that there is very little understanding, I think, of what Zionism is and why anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is so dangerous. Yes, I agree. Um, and uh, that's why I think um, a government condemnation uh, is good, but it's, uh, it's not good enough. And as I just said, uh, I think we need to build a coalition of uh, democracies against amnesty, just as we sometimes manage to do uh, at the uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, 
Yeah. Because being on the defensive is not enough. We must go on the offensive. Mm. Uh, and Amnesty has basically initiated a coordinated campaign with uh, lots of money, uh, lots of media coverage. And we, I mean, the state of Israel together with uh, pro-Israel organizations such as Elnet, uh, must, do, uh, uh, must do that too against uh, Amnesty, which is to expose their ideology, their funding, uh, the cover-up of human rights violations in uh, China and in uh, Muslim countries, uh, and explain also, and that's a very important point, explain that if the uh, Jewish right uh, to national uh, self-determination uh, is under attack, then no right uh, to national self-determination, especially uh, in the West, uh, is immune. Uh, and that, I think, is something that needs to be explained in the West that Israel is the first target of this ideology that consists in denying the Jews their right to self-determination. But when you look at the woke movement in the, in the West and this undermining of the foundation of Western civilization, it starts with Israel, but it doesn't end with Israel. Absolutely. And of course, Amnesty International here in the UK have strong links with organizations um, like BDS um, yeah. and, and Stop the War and all of which um, are, are focused on uh, blaming Israel for all, all the ills and demonizing Israel. But it does win hearts and minds with us there. It is very worrying because mm -hmm. some campuses, and that's where, you know, there's a pipeline there for people who become MPs eventually and local councillors and decision makers and influencers. So it's, it, it is more dangerous than people sometimes realize um, mm -hmm. Can I move on and ask you about something that is now absolutely um, in front of everybody at the moment? Um, even t today and, and at all the time on all the news now is the whole topic of Russia on the border, massing its troops uh, on the border with Ukraine. And we had... President Macron's recent meeting with President Putin. Um, I wonder, you know, we've had further meetings since then between UK and EU ministers. We've had the call with President Biden. We've just had Liz Truss warning today that uh, they think an invasion is imminent. You've, you've had quite a lot to say about this. We would be really interested to know what is your take on the likelihood that a diplomatic agreement can be found for Russia to withdraw its troops from the Ukraine, even at this late hour? So <clears throat> I think that in order to uh, convincingly uh, answer your question, uh, I would need to know what Putin really wants. And that is unclear. I mean, if he's just bluffing to remove the uh, economic sanctions that the West had imposed on Russia, uh, after its annexation of Crimea in 2014, then an agreement should be possible. If Putin is seriously planning on invading the Ukraine or part of it, and if he's willing to pay the economic price for his move, then no agreement is uh, possible. Uh, as uh, U.S. diplomat George Kennan uh, had written back in uh, 1946, Russia has always been <clears throat> and always will be an irredentist country. I mean, Russia didn't become the uh, largest country on earth uh, by luck or through meditation. Uh, Putin has described the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union as, quote, the biggest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Now, since becoming president of Russia, and that was, by the way, 23 years ago, with a short uh, interim period in the meantime where he was prime minister, he has been uh, bent on avenging what he sees as uh, Russia's historical humiliation. Uh, it started with uh, Chechnya in uh, 2000, it went on with Georgia in 2008, and then Crimea in 2014. And, and he uses the same salami tactics in uh, what the Russians call their near abroad. Now, he also sows the vision in the West, in Europe, by uh, backing Eurosceptic uh, political parties and by uh, broadcasting his uh, propaganda in as many languages as possible, uh, 
via uh, Russia Today and uh, Sputnik. Now, I I'm still not convinced that he'll actually cross the Rubicon because the economic price Russia will pay will be huge. I mean, don't forget that the, uh, the Russian economy is basically a gas station and that its uh, GDP is the size of uh, Spain's. So it is very vulnerable uh, to sanctions, unlike China, by the way, which is not. But on the other hand, uh, Putin has been uh, getting ready for uh, possible sanctions by piling up about $600 billion of foreign reserves in the uh, Russian central bank. So it's impossible uh, to tell. I mean, uh, as Churchill would say, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. <laughs> sure. <laughs> There are a lot of countries, aren't there, that are now beginning to evacuate families um, uh, of diplomatic staff and advising, um, you know, their citizens who are living in Ukraine to leave. And I think um, that includes Israel. So there's, yeah. you know, do they know, you know, that, you know, sounds like there's some optimism in what you've said, but do, do you think these, um, these governments know something we don't, or is this just a just-in-case policy? I think in the case of Israel, it's, it's more an in-case policy because I don't think anybody knows uh, what uh, Putin has actually decided. Mm. Uh, I mean, there is evidence, of course, of uh, massive concentration of Russian troops at the border with the Ukraine. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the decision belongs to him. Yeah. And uh, I don't think any amount of intelligence can tell us uh, what he has actually decided and also if the uh, negotiations between the US and uh, Russia has produced anything in terms of the lifting of sanctions and in terms of a commitment uh, not to uh, negotiate with Ukraine, the, uh, the joining of uh, NATO in the future, which is really what he cares about. So uh, I, still, I still believe there's room for optimism. Okay. Um, just to stick with the kind of Ukraine for a moment, I'll broaden it out. Um, and this situation between Russia and Ukraine, it does bring to the fore disagreements about, um, well, over the historical precedents in the distribution of land in Europe, which have been in place since World War II and the Cold War. I just wondered what you think, it, given Germany's transition away from um, Angela Merkel's leadership and elections in France looming, in the coming months. Do you think the power balances are shifting and is European foreign policy entering a whole new era? So first of all, there's no doubt that uh, Putin might have been more cautious and uh, restrained if uh, Angela Merkel was uh, still in power. I mean, he uh, respected her, even though that respect was not exactly uh, mutual uh, as uh, Merkel came to despise Putin for his lies. But back in 2014, Merkel had taken the lead in imposing sanctions uh, on Russia. She uh, had convinced all EU members, which were 28 at the time, uh, to join the sanctions regime. And she had established uh, the uh, Normandy format with France together with uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine. Uh, by contrast, Olaf Scholz uh, was almost invisible on the Ukraine crisis until uh, last week. I mean, people in Washington uh, started complaining that he was on mute. Uh, last week, he was basically summoned to Washington for what was uh, more or less a dress down. Uh, and now he's finally being more forceful vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Uh, he's in Moscow today, but despite this uh, show of unity, he still refused during his press conference with President Biden last week commit to a suspension of Nord Stream 2 in case of a Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Now, Putin knows that Germany's uh, social democratic party uh, has uh, no lack of uh, what is called in German, Russland Kirchter, German word for those who understand Russia. I mean, Nord Stream 1 and 2 were built uh, by a consortium headed by Gerhard Schröder, uh, 
a former German chancellor and social democrat. As for uh, Emmanuel Macron, I think he has uh, basically given up on Putin. Uh, I mean, earlier in his presidency, Macron spoke about building a partnership with Russia. Putin has basically turned him down. So Macron is now ready to get tougher on Putin, but that actually barely makes uh, a difference because Putin has been talking directly to Biden over the heads of the Europeans. Also, don't forget, as you mentioned, that Macron uh, has a narrow margin when it comes to Russia because he faces re-election in two months and because French uh, public opinion is far from being hostile to Russia. Uh, the French have their own uh, Ruslan Verster, what is commonly called in French Russophile. Uh, except for the uh, center-right uh, candidate Valérie Pécresse, uh, Macron's main contenders have uh, stronger sympathies for Russia than for America. And that includes uh, Eric Zemmour and Marine Le Pen on the right, and uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon on the left. Uh, all three, by the way, have uh, committed to pull France out of NATO. My guess is that Macron will get tougher uh, on Putin still after his uh, likely re-election in April, but unfortunately, at that time, it would likely be too far too late uh, for Ukraine. And of course, what we, you know, we know with Putin, he's not fond of backing down, is he? Um, he's not going to back down unless he gets uh, uh, what he wants, which is not clear exactly. Does he only want a commitment that NATO will never expand to the Ukraine? And does he just want to uh, remove the sanctions imposed in 2014? Or is he really serious about undoing a part, at least, of NATO's achievements uh, by including the former members of the Warsaw Pact? And that's a big question. Uh, but another problem with Putin is that I mentioned before he's been in power for 23 years. And when you have an autocrat who's been in power for so long, that has basically gotten rid of any opposition uh, mm -hmm. in the media, in politics. Nobody is telling him that he's wrong. Nobody is telling him in his immediate entourage that he's going too far. Uh, he's surrounded by uh, yes men, and there is no opposition to what he's doing. And that is one of the uh, big dangers of uh, autocrats when they stay too long in power. And do you think he's much emboldened by um, the annexation of the Crimea in 2014? Mm -hmm. And that seemed pretty crucial event to which uh, he kind of, despite a response internationally, he obviously feels he got away with it. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder then in the light of all that, you know, do you think what maybe what he wants is, is, is therefore, you know, greater influence in this, in the European balance of security? You know, they have a, Russia has a permanent seat on the UN Security Council and along with China, offers support and backing to Iran. So what do you think this means for the prospects of negotiations in Vienna, for instance? Because these foreign policy issues are not all divorced from each other or from their, um, the, the aims of leaders like Putin. So, you know, in, in, an, in the end, I mean, an agreement that genuinely curbs the nuclear capabilities of the Iranian re regime, do you, what do you think the likelihood of that is, given that we can't seem to persuade him to step back from the Ukraine? So first of all, you, you mentioned the, uh, the Security Council and the fact, of course, that Russia has a uh, veto power there. And the truth of the matter is that uh, this veto power goes back to uh, February 1945, at the Yalta conference, when uh, Stalin had demanded and obtained uh, from Roosevelt uh, a veto power at what would become the uh, UN Security Council, because Stalin knew that otherwise uh, the vote of the Soviet Union at the Security Council would be outnumbered by the Anglo-Saxon powers and by China at the time, which back then was still run by uh, Chiang Kai-shek and therefore was aligned with the West. Now, this uh, veto power has enabled Russia to basically neutralize the Security Council during the Cold War, but it has continued to do so 
uh, even after the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union, which is why uh, the Security Council, for example, never allowed the use of force against Serbia uh, during the Yugoslav Civil War. Now, back in uh, 2010, uh, Russia and China uh, had allowed the uh, passing of sanctions against Iran at the Security Council. Today, uh, they're no longer playing balls with the U.S. They're both challenging the U.S.-led uh, world order. And as far as they're concerned, the U.S. is only itself to blame for quitting the JCPOA in 2018. Also, Russia has an economic interest today in not reimposing sanctions on Iran. And the reason for that is that Russia wants Iran to remain an exporter of natural gas. Because for years, Russia has been trying to build the uh, equivalent of OPEC natural gas together with Iran and Qatar. It's taken together, those uh, three countries hold about two thirds of the world's proven reserves of natural gas. And such a cartel, Russia hopes, would help slow down the decline of prices for natural gas a decline which itself is caused today mostly by the increase of supply uh, worldwide thanks to America's uh, fracking industry and thanks to the fact that America in recent years has become the world's biggest producer of natural gas. And of course, as Russia and America are facing uh, off each other in Ukraine, don't expect Russia to cooperate on the nuclear negotiations in Vienna. And anyways, uh, Iran is uh, basically a threshold country as we're talking. So those negotiations have become mostly uh, a smokescreen. And therefore, the real question at this point is, what will be America's strategy to deter Iran uh, after uh, the likely uh, failure of the uh, negotiations in, in Vienna? And that is really uh, the big question, much more than knowing uh, what will come out of those uh, negotiations, because I think at this point, the answer uh, to this question is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rob Malley, the US negotiator in Vienna, um, gave a closed door briefing to the Senate on the warnings from experts who've claimed that Iran could obtain enough fissile material to build a nuclear weapon within weeks, should it want to. It, um, it does make you wonder about the, how worthwhile these talks in Vienna actually are. Exactly. I mean, he, he said it himself. So, so it means that Iran is already a threshold country. Yeah, absolutely. And Nancy Pelosi is um, scheduled to visit Israel this week um, to address growing concerns, I think. Is that right? I, I was just wondering to what, you know, how would you say, um, how, um, how much do Israel feel that they're standing alone on these issues and to what extent do they feel they can rely on allies in the West? I know that you know, the UK and Israel have formed a move from friendship to a strong partnership, but um, for Israel, they obviously are absolutely in the front line of the threat from Iran. Um, how, do, right. how, how, how is that? You know, what's the atmosphere in, Iran, in, in Israel about that? And how much do they feel that their allies are standing with them? So first of all, I, I do think that America does stand very strongly with Israel. When you look at the uh, military uh, help and support that Israel gets from uh, America. Uh, and uh, I think also America is uh, working on uh, uh, strengthening the uh, regional alliance between Israel and the Sunni uh, monarchies uh, against, uh, against Iran. Um, I do believe also that one important question is whether Iran, and that's a very important question, very strategic important question, whether Iran is going to satisfy itself with being a threshold uh, nuclear state or is actually going to cross that threshold. And that is a very big difference because there's a difference between being a few weeks away from a bomb and actually having one, which is what North Korea did. Um, my guess is that Iran uh, would pay a very high economic price, including from its allies 
including from China and Russia, uh, were it to actually uh, become a nuclear military power and not only a threshold one. Um, and it might be that Iran will satisfy itself with being a threshold country, in which case, of course, uh, it would change Israel's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran because then it would become a classic case of uh, mutual deterrence. Uh, the uh, Iran, Iran is led by a uh, theocracy, but despite, despite the fact that, of course, on the one hand, this uh, Iranian theocracy has a very strong ideology, a very strong religious and fundamentalist ideology, uh, which includes a belief that in order for the 12th Imam to come back, uh, Israel must be destroyed. So they have this ideology on the one hand. On the other hand, I believe that regardless of your ideology, everybody understands very, very well the concept of deterrence. And they know exactly what Israel's military capabilities are. Uh, and uh, there are two things that have been proven when it comes to uh, nuclear proliferation. A, is that countries that... Uh, wanted to acquire uh, nuclear weapons, have been able to do so despite the opposition of the international community and of the great powers. That includes, according to foreign reports, Israel in the late 60s. That includes India in 1974. Uh, that includes Pakistan in 1998, and of course, North Korea in 2006. Uh, but there is another thing that we've learned from uh, nuclear proliferation is that uh, deterrence actually works. Thankfully, there's never been a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. And even the North Korean dictator knows perfectly well what would be the consequence on himself, on his regime and on his country uh, if he would actually use nuclear weapons against South Korea or Japan. So he has acquired his deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the US and the West in terms of preserving his regime, but he also understands deterrence in the way that he knows exactly what would happen to him and his country uh, if, he would, if he would have the madness of using those weapons. Mm -hmm. Finally, from, from me, and then I'm going to open it up to our, our, our audience who are, are all listening. Um, perhaps a word about the Abraham Accords. Um, how will that play out for Israel when it comes to curbing this threat from Iran? So I think very clearly what we have today is uh, A, the, uh, the Abraham Accords uh, were also not only but also the outcome of a mutual fear uh, for Iran uh, from its uh, immediate neighbors such as the UAE and Bahrain, uh, especially after the signature of the JCPOA. Um, and after the U.S. pulled out from the JCPOA, uh, those countries realized that um, the strongest military power in the Middle East today is Israel. And that Israel is their best guarantee together with the U.S. Uh, against uh, the Iranian uh, military threat. But those countries also have serious doubts about the future of the U.S. military commitment to the Middle East. Uh, obviously, especially after the uh, uh, withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, which did send quite a message about uh, how the U.S. decides to cut its losses when it uh, decides that it should do so. Now, we know that uh, today uh, the United States, uh, the U.S. economy no longer depends on the Middle East for its oil supplies. Uh, which in a way is a good thing, but on the other hand, it also means that there's very little reason today for the U.S. to have such a heavy military presence in the region when it imports less than 6% of its uh, oil consumption from the Middle East. Uh, and I think this is also one of the reasons why the uh, Gulf states, especially the UAE and Bahrain, uh, decided to openly get closer to Israel. Uh, because um, there are many question marks about the future and the commitment of the U.S. Uh, in the Middle East. Mind you, it doesn't mean, of course, that the U.S. is going to leave the Middle East any soon because um, they're not going to, uh, even, even though they, they depend much less on the Middle East for their oil uh, 
uh, imports uh, if they were to uh, simply leave the the uh, the Gulf of Hormuz or the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Hormuz, that would be too much of a gamble. We have about 22% of the world's oil exports going through the Straits of Hormuz. And if the U.S. fleet were, was not to, uh, uh, you know, be the policeman of that region, then it would leave, uh, that would leave the, uh, the door to the, uh, to the Russians, and especially to the Chinese. Mm. In other words, the, uh, the calculation of the U.S. in the region is not only economic, it's also geopolitical and, and strategic. But I think the, uh, the Abraham Accords, and also this brings me back also to what we said at the beginning about the amnesty report, uh, goes to show that today, in today's Middle East, uh, the, uh, you, know, you have this paradox. On the one hand, you have the Europeans, in that case, the UK was amnesty, uh, UK, still stuck in the, propag in the Soviet propaganda of the 70s. But in the real life, in the Middle East today, uh, you have those Arab countries making peace with Israel, not only because they need Israel for its uh, military power and its technology to help win themselves from oil, uh, but also because, you know, they, they themselves uh, have uh, up way past the old propaganda of the 70s and they recognize Israel, they recognize the Jews as their cousins. Uh, that's the Middle East. But in Europe, people are still stuck with, uh, they're still stuck in the 1970s uh, and never got past it. And that's an interesting paradox. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much.